presumed mastery at different points by some presidents, but on foreign policy, complex foreign policy, involving the Middle East and the situation in Ukraine, this is as good as it gets with an American president. Just imagine that. Imagine Donald Trump hearing this next question that you're going to hear from New York Times foreign policy reporter David Sanger, and then imagine what Donald Trump would say in response. What you know Donald Trump wouldn't know how to do is actually answer anything that David Sanger asks in this complex question. Mr. President, uh, the NATO declaration that was uh, issued yesterday um, was very notable because it described China as a decisive neighbor of the war in Ukraine and for its provision of critical goods to the Russians. Um, that's part of a, a broader partnership that seeks to cement in place in the past two or three years. I think one that you were a little bit doubtful of when we asked you about it some time ago. So I'd be interested to know whether you have a strategy now of trying to interrupt the partnership between China and Russia, and whether or not in a second term you would pursue that, if you could describe that strategy to us. And along the way, could you also tell us whether you think, just to follow up on Felicia's question, that if you were in a room with Vladimir Putin again, the way you were three years ago, or with President Xi, that a few years from now you will be able to go negotiate with them, handle them one-on-one? -on -one. Well, the first part of your question is, we discussed and I raised in the NATO summit, and others raised, the future of China's involvement, what they're going to do, what they're doing with Russia, in terms of accommodating, facilitating, them, they're getting access to additional, they're not supplying, they're not supplying weapons themselves, they're supplying mechanisms for them to be able to get weapons. And China's position is, Basically, and I've spent more time with Xi Jinping than any world leader has over 90 hours since being vice president all the way through, for real. And by the way, I handed all my notes. Uh, but my point is that she believes that China is a large enough market that they can entice any country, including European countries, to invest there in return for commitments to, from Europe to do A, B, C, or D, or not to do certain things. What's happened is we had a longer discussion about what we cannot, we have to make clear China has to understand that if they are supplying Russia with information and capacity, along with working with North Korea and others to help Russia and armament, that they're not going to benefit economically as a consequence of that by getting the kind of investment they're looking for. And so, for example, we're in a situation where, one, and we've reestablished direct contact with China after that, remember the balloon, quote unquote, going down, all of a sudden thing came to an end. Well, we set up a new mechanism. There's a direct line between she and me and our military has direct access to one another and they contact one another when we have problems. The issue is that we have to make sure that she understands there's a price to pay for undercutting both the Pacific Basin as well as Europe and it relates to Russia and dealing with Ukraine. And so we, for example, if you want to invest in China, as you know, you know this area really well. If you want to invest in China, you have to have a 51% Chinese owner. You have to make sure that you do by their rules. And you, can't, you don't have the authority, and you have to provide all access to all the data and information you have. There was a while there, as you recall, in the last administration and other administrations where the access to that market was enticing enough to get companies to come in because they had access to over a billion people in the market, 
than a lot of people in the market. And so they were doing it. But that, that got curtailed when we started saying we're going to play by the same rules. For example, the idea they don't abide by the international rules related to subsidizing products by the government funding. So guess what? They're not going to be able to export their electric vehicles to the United States without a significant tariff. Others are doing the same thing around the world. But it is a concern. It is a concern that you have both China, South Korea, North Korea, Russia, Iran, countries that are not necessarily coordinated in the past, looking to figure out how they can have impact. Impact? Yes, I do, but I'm not prepared to talk about the detail of it in public. Uh, and I think you'll see that some of our European friends are going to be curtailing their investment in Russia, I mean, in, excuse me, in, uh, in China, as long as China continues to have this indirect success, help to Russia in terms of being able to help their economy as well as, as well as help them in as a consequence that their ability to fight in, in, uh, in Ukraine. The other thing we talked a lot about is that, and I raised it, and there was, I, I didn't hear any, I can't swear that everyone agreed because not everybody got to talk about it, but we have, a, we need a new industrial policy in the West. For example, we talked about how both the EU as well as NATO has to be able to begin to build their own munition capacity has to be able to generate their own capacity to provide for weapons and the ability to, well, it came as a surprise to some of us how we had fallen behind in the West in terms of the ability to construct new material, new weaponry, new, new everything from, from vehicles to weapon systems. And so one of the things that came out of this was, we're going to be meeting again with one of my colleagues, my European colleagues, is what do we do to increase the capacity of the West, particularly in Europe and Japan, to be able to generate the kind of ability to produce their own weapon systems? Not just for themselves, but to be able to generate that. It's the same, that's what, that's what Russia is trying to figure out, that they went to China and they didn't get the weapons, but then they went to North Korea. But we're going to be in a position where the West is going to become the industrial base for the ability to have all the defensive weapons that we need. That was a discussion as well. I whether you would be ready to go deal with Putin and Xi two or three years from now. I'm ready to deal with them now and three years from now. Look, um, the... Uh, Like I said, I'm dealing with Xi right now and direct contact with him. Uh, I have no good reason to talk to Putin right now. Uh, there's not much that uh, he is prepared to do in terms of accommodating any change in his behavior. And, uh, but there isn't any world leader I'm not prepared to deal with. But I, I, I understand in a generic point is, is Putin ready to talk? I'm not ready to talk to Putin unless Putin's ready to change his, his behavior. And the idea, look, Putin's got a problem. First of all, in this war that he is supposedly have won, and by the way, I think, don't hold me the exact number, but I think that Russia had 17.3% of of Ukraine that they've conquered now at 17.4, I mean, in terms of percentage of territory. They've not been very successful. They've caused horrible damage, loss of life, but they've also lost over 350,000 troops, military, killed or wounded. They have over a million people 
particularly young people with technical, te technical capability, leading Russia because they see no future there. They've got a problem. But what they do have control of is they are very good at controlling and running the public outcry that relates to how they use mechanisms to communicate with people. They lie like hell to the constituencies. They lie like hell about what's going on. And, uh, and so the idea that we're going to be able to fundamentally change Russia in the near term is not likely. But one thing for certain, if what we allow Russia to succeed in Ukraine, they're not stopping in Ukraine. I recommend, I know you know this because you've, you've written about it. Read Putin's speech after they moved in, what it was all about in Kiev. It wasn't about just, anyway, read what his objective is. And anyway, but so I, I think that uh, I'm prepared to talk to any leader who wants to talk, including Putin called me and wanted to talk. Last time I talked to Putin was trying to get him to work on an arms control agreement related to nuclear weapons in space. That didn't go very far. So my point is, I'm prepared to talk to anybody, but I don't see any inclination. There is an inclination on the part of the Chinese to keep in contact with me, because they're not sure where this all goes. And look what's happened in Asia. We have strengthened the Asian Pacific area more than anyone else has. We, you know, we just put together this. today, we, we had, we, I brought on, I asked our NATO allies that we bring on the group from the South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Australia. I, 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 I already mentioned Australia. And I met twice now, I think, with 14 leaders of the Pacific Island nations. And we've slowed down what's going on. We slow down China's reach. But there's a lot of work to do. This is a moving target. And I don't take the light of it. That question by David Sanger was better than any of the questions asked during the debate. And the answer was better than anything either one of the candidates, Joe Biden or Trump, said during the debate. Thereby exposing, among other things, the absurdity of the debate format and the two minute pressure cooker answer system for someone who you can see actually thinks. He actually thinks. You can see him thinking while he's answering. And so if you give him the time, that's what his answer is going to sound like. And it's going to range the globe and it's going to be authoritative and accurate on every aspect of it. The president was, of course, asked about his ability to do the job of president. 